Hi, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Trashy Divorces. Hey, everybody. I am Stacy, and this is my fabulous co-host, Alicia. Y'all, this week we're talking about the leading ladies, the Rat Pack dolls, and the Ocean's Eleven films. The first, 1960, the second, 2001. I've got the trashy divorce of Angie Dickinson and Burt Bacharach this week. I have the profoundly not trashy divorce of Julia Roberts and Lyle Lovett. To be fair, neither one were actually... That trashy. That trashy. These are two, really, these are cool people. Two really classy dames, yeah. y'all. Luck Be a Lady is our theme song this week. Another classic by Tony and Pulitzer Prize winning returning songwriter for Trashy Divorces, Frank Loser. He is the uh, baby it's cold outside, man. Oh, is he now? Which actually is fitting today. We had some snow in Atlanta. Baby, we, it is cold outside. We did. We woke up to extra large size, like industrial strength snow, but it's way too warm for it to accumulate anywhere. So That's for sure. Sorry, snowflakes. Today, the song, though, is not Baby, It's Cold Outside, even though it is fitting. It is Luck Be a Lady. This one was featured in the 1955 movie Guys and Dolls, starring Marlon Brando and our boy Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra. How about some Magic Mirror from the Patreon oh, machine? Oh, y'all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All of our new friends in the Magic Mirror this week. Stacy, with tremendous thanks and fanfare, start us out. Sure. Thank you to Taylor O, Natasha H, Nicole G, Elizabeth W, Catherine R, Kelly N, Michelle S, Victoria J, Kirsten J, Heather B. Also, we have a couple of new super supporters this week. So thank you to Edria and Antonia. And to all of our existing and new patrons. Oh my gosh. Thank you so, so, so much to all of you. It is so much fun to make all the extra content through the week in so many threads, y'all. We have the Trashy brand on lockdown on Patreon. We've got Trashy Tutors, Trashy Politics, Dirty Digs is your new ultra fun fun thing. Church of the Flaming Dumpster Fire, Trash Astrology. And all these limited series that we're constantly spooling out. You've got Fun with Done. We did Side Pieces and now Ocean's Eleven. So if you need more Trashy Divorces, head on over to patreon.com slash Trashy Divorces for the hundreds and hundreds of hours of extra content, trash candy style. Yup. All right, let's get into it. Let's see how nice these dames are. I don't think they blow on other guys' dice. <laughs> Not sure how comfortable I am with that image. It's the lyric of the song. <laughs> hey, let's hope luck is a lady for this episode. Yep, sounds good. All right, are you ready to go, go, go? Let's do it. Alicia, you have a story this week that suggests that there have been beautiful women in Hollywood forever? Forever. <laughs> this, this is... News to me. This is one of the best, though. Even uh, when it was black and white. This week, friends, I've got a got a story for you. The trashy divorce of Angie Dickinson and Burt Bacharach. Part of our Ocean's Eleven season. That's exactly right. Angie. <sighs> this girl is a dame. I dig her so hard. Legs for days. At one point, they are insured for a million dollars. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Angie Dickinson, just a lady who is a combination of toughness and tender. She runs with everyone in the Hollywood scene throughout generations. She was the it girl in the 60s. She, like, remained. Like, uh, she's awesome. She stars with everyone. She's in the thick of it. She's a man's woman and a woman's woman. And she endured a lot for this love. She will call this love the greatest affair of her life. Who landed this name? Burt Bacharach, this guy. Music, right? Oh, my God. He's the songwriter of our generation. Okay. Well-known and award-winning. You may not know, but this dude wrote the music for the soundtrack you have heard your whole life. Do you mean the Cotton theme song? The Fabric of Our Lives. The Fabric of Our Lives. Did he write that? Because that's the one that really sticks with me. That is not the one I have listed. Uh, Here's (laughs) what I have listed. Uh, Do you know the way to San Jose? Okay. Raindrops keep falling on my head. Yeah. Okay. I say a little prayer for you. Oh. Oh, baby, it's you by the Shirelles. Wishing and hoping. Walk on by. Alfie. What's new, pussycat? Oh, oh, one of my favorites. Um, Just like me, they long to be mm, close, close to, to you. you. Mm. Arthur's theme. 
Um, that's what friends are for. Heard it. ETs. Put on your hard light. Also, I did not know this. Burt Bacharach also wrote, always something there to remind me that naked eyes covered that I was familiar with. Interesting. Yeah, I would. Oh, my know, God. I thought that was a very modern thing in the 80s or whatever. If you lived in the 60s, 70s or 80s, Burt Bacharach has composed the music of your life. Not the words. And not the cotton song. And not the cotton song. <laughs> Bird is going to have a lot of songwriting partners through the years, but dude writes some melodies. Like, he's a composer extraordinaire. The one melody that Bert cannot write is making a lasting marriage with Angie Dickinson. No amount of good composition is going to save these two. I mean, Uh, it's... There, wow, such parallels in our stories this week. Let's get into it. Angeline Brown. Born September 30th. She's a Libra baby. 1931. In the tiniest of towns in North Dakota. Like 740 people. Angeline's parents create the weekly newspaper for the town. It is called the Edgley Mail. Angie lives with her two sisters and her parents in a tiny apartment behind the newspaper office. Mom typesets. Dad does the articles. But dad also has a part-time gig on the weekend, and he is the projectionist for the town movie theater. Cool, cool, yeah. cool. Yeah, so the, Angie and her two, like, they're always at the movies. Mm-hmm. It's a happy family. It's sure. a Catholic family. The movie theater burns down. Angie's devastated. Okay, but Dad was not in it at the no, time. No, no, no. no okay. I don't know if anyone was hurt, but, <laughs> like, everybody's sad. Like, the movies were the thing that, okay, 1942, the family is getting the hell out of North Dakota. Angie's 10. And they, like so many other families, where do they go? They need to get to a town with a theater. California. (laughs) Angie's cute. She's smart. And Angie growing up in a tiny bit town in North Dakota already knows that she never wants to rely on a man for money. At the time in the 1930s, career choices for women are mother or teacher or nurse. Angie's interested in becoming a writer. She's going to graduate high school, attend some college classes. Once she knows enough to be a secretary out of college, I'm a secretary now, and there's this like beauty pageant happening. And she's like, ah, what the hell? Why not? Of course, beautiful Angie Dickinson is one of the winners. And uh, the coordinators of the pageant are like, hey, with winning, come on to the Colgate Comedy Hour. Oh, that Colgate comedy yeah. hour. Wow. Okay. Big, big deal. And this is why I love Angie Dickinson so hard. She's like, yeah, uh, how much does it pay? Good for her. <laughs> I'm not in it for the exposure. And they told her how much it paid. And she was like, oh, I'm in. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is the early 1950s. And talk about some magic. So she shows up, the Colgate comedy hour, walks in, and uh, Jimmy Durante and Frank Sinatra are the stars on the show that night. Boom! I walk in and meet Frank Sinatra. There's a spark right away between Frank and Angie. And although it will take a few more years for them to hook up, because she has a first marriage to go through, Angie is going to marry a football player named Jean Dickinson in June of 1952. She will keep, this is how... Mm -hmm. She becomes Angie Dickinson. Right. She'll keep the name even after their divorce in 1960 after eight years of marriage. See, what she should have done upon divorcing him was just change her last name to Sinatra. <laughs> no, I know. They never married. It's fine. It, but not that it wasn't discussed. Hold Ooh. on. Hold on. Okay. So during the marriage to Jean Dickinson, she and Jean are really good couple friends with John Kenneth Galbraith and his wife, Catherine. He serves as a U.S. ambassador to India in four administrations from FDR to LBJ. So Angie was a Democrat before. She is now truly committed to the cause. Just thought that was something kind of interesting. Yeah, no, I've heard of uh, I've heard of that guy. He's yeah, definitely a big deal and definitely a big deal diplomacy. So Angie's working through the marriage with hubby number one Jean, steadily making her way. So from 1954, she begins in smaller parts until her real breakout role in 1959 in a little film called Rio Bravo. 
starring opposite John Wayne. John Wayne. It's a big deal. And she's like kind of afraid to talk to him because she's a Democrat and he's such a Republican. She's like, I can't get into it. I can't get into it with him. Okay. Angie's career is taken off. She is kind of cast as this blonde sex symbol, but not Marilyn Monroe or Jane Mansfield raw sex. There's something different more, more about wholesome. her. She's not like every other girl. And Angie will reject roles that turn her into only a sex symbol. She wants some substance. Like she's making a name of her own. 1960. And she's going to star in a little film called Ocean's Eleven. Really? With our Rat Pack gang. And she is the doll of the Rat Pack. She's also now divorcing Jean. So she's a single lady. Angie Dickinson says about that time, Hey, as a single woman, you had better know what you are hanging around for. Or you're going to get in a lot of trouble. Yeah. I wasn't trying to hook up. Right. But she does. Angie and Frank Sinatra are going to carry on a very long on and off affair for about 10 years. Angie will say he was the most important man in her life. They do talk about the M word. The, that's what they call it. The M word comes up. But Angie wants to be a movie star. That's Angie's dream. And Frank, having some experience with wives mm-hmm. that have been movie stars. Yes, Ava Gardner. Mm-hmm. And Frank says to her, I'm not going to marry an actress. And Angie says, I don't blame you. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. (laughs) She later says, like, she's really glad he didn't ask because she would have had to have said no. I didn't want to say no, but I would have. Uh, Okay. So what's ironic here is that old Frankie boy is going to do just that, marry an actress in just a few years with Mia Farrow. So take that for what it's worth. So Angie's linked at this time with lots of other men. There's rumors of a JFK hookup, which she denies. Needless to say, Angie is hot and single and simply having a marvelous time in the swinging early 60s. Well, except for that time starring in The Killers with John Casavantes, who she has this like really steamy thing with. But then Ronald Reagan, our future president, slaps her. Okay, but he doesn't because it's Hollywood. Right. Okay, but here's the thing. He doesn't really slap her. And that is Ronald Reagan's shtick. Every time they see each other from that movie in 1964 on, he always is like, Angie, I'm really, I'm so glad I didn't really hit you. <laughs> like like slap across the face kind of yeah. like within the. Within the plot of the movie. Right. Yes. Okay. I know. Like nails her. Right. Boom. But he doesn't really, but apparently that's his go-to. Gotcha. Oh, hey, Angie. Remember that time? I'm so glad I almost didn't hit you. Anyway. I wonder if he maybe got closer than they'd rehearsed it, and and it was that was a kind of a controversial, like in nineteen sixty four. Gotcha. Okay. okay, it was a scene. So this seems like a groovy depot to leave Angie on. Let's leave leave her here for a hot minute and talk about her husband number two. Okay, the once and future groom this week, Burt Bacharach. Okay, ugh. I mean, he's not ugh. He's a wonderful songwriter. Maybe just not cut out for marriage, Burt. Born May the 12th, 1928. He's a Taurus boy. He is born in Kansas City. And uh, da-da-da-da-da, breaking news. It turns out this is in Missouri. Mm. Just uh, want everybody Kansas to know Kansas City, that. Missouri then. Not, not interestingly, Kansas City, Kansas. Correct. No, Kansas City, Missouri. Missouri. Okay. okay. But he grows up in New York City. He's the son of a syndicated columnist. His mom is an amateur painter. Yay. And is like an amateur songwriter. And she's like, Bert, you simply have to take piano lessons, which he does. And he's super talented. He studies music. Like, he gets his, like, music is his thing. He's sneaking into clubs. It's cool. He heads to war. He comes back. Bert is going to spend the next few years as pianist and composer accompanist. Accompany and. A company mouse. <laughs> the accompany mouse, yes, for Vic Damone. Accompanyist. Accompanyist for I- Vic Damone. He's going to work for all kinds of folks. Polly Bergen, Steve Lawrence, and also a lady named Paula Stewart, who will become Bert's first wife in 1953. Okay. So Bert, at the age of 27, is working in the Brill Building. Y'all can't even tell you on my spreadsheet how many hot takes I have just dropped and will drop all through the story about stuff that's coming. Anyway. Bert, working in the Brill Building, and he meets this dude named Hal David. 
Hal David is going to write Bert's words. Bert writes the music. Hal's going to write the words. This is your first iteration of Elton John and Bertie Topin. Gotcha. Right? Okay. okay. So he meets Hal David. In 1957, they make their first hit, Magic Moments for Perry Como. Okay. During the next four years, they're going to write 80 songs. None of them are going to be hits like that first one. Bert's a little distracted. Because in 1956, Bert is recommended to be the accompany mouse, accompany it. Damn it! The piano player for the pi- I, am, I need more coffee. The accompany mouse. The piano mouse. player for Marlena Dietrich. Okay. Okay. So he goes out to California to meet her. He comes to play. She loves it, and she's like, "Oh, Frank Sinatra should totally record that song you just played for me." This is 56. Frank Sinatra turns it down. Marlena is mad. She's like, you don't even know, Frank, how good this guy is. So she hires him. He is her piano guy. (laughs) When she is a smash in Las Vegas. Okay. Right? We've talked about this in Patreon. She goes and appears at the Sahara making bank. And then Mae West comes. Anyway. Gotcha. Not important. Okay. Record breaking. By 1958, Bert's first marriage with Paula is done. Because Bert's on the road with Marlena, right? Okay, here's the thing. This is all coming from his biography released in 2013. Marlena wants him bad. And Bert Bacharach is like, he says, it would have been like falling in love with fire. Which I thought was such a great way to Mm -hmm. describe falling in love with fire. Yeah. Yeah. According to his book, they never have a physical romance, but the affair that he and Marlena have takes place on stage every night. And once he's divorced, Marlena is like, Bert, you do not need to be married. It is not your thing. Don't do it. Don't do it ever again. It is not what you were cut out for. Like, do your music. Be in love with me on stage every night. That's fine. But don't get married. So here's the thing. Mm -hmm. Bert, I think, is always searching for his muse, his manic pixie dream girl, but she has to have legs. Mm -hmm. He will go to compose for Dionne Warwick. Uh He breaks her into being a big star. But he's still doing his thing with Marlena Dietrich. And he's kind of torn with all this momentum happening. And he's rolling along and riding high and banging on piano keys at the trashy divorces depot. Okay, so... (laughs) Let's get these kids together. Okay. 1965. Angie's actually met Bert's parents. And Bert's parents are playing fucking matchmaker, matchmaker. Bert's dad is like, Angie, you have to marry my son. Oh. And then they call oh. Bert on the phone like, Not like you meet. have to marry Angie. Okay. No. But like, so, marry. Okay. Hey, son, we found your new wife. That's exactly what he calls Angie. What son doesn't want to hear this? <laughs> calls Angie. <laughs> When he gets into, like, flies into California. Hey, Angie, I'm Bert Backrack. My parents, I understand, really want us to meet. Can I take you out so we can tell them it doesn't work and I can get them off our backs? I'm so sorry. Blah, blah, blah. Good answer. Good answer. They Good. go out. Mm-hmm. It doesn't not work. They're married 10 weeks later. <laughs> For real, 10 weeks. Okay, just so many parallels in our stories. Go ahead. Woo! 10 weeks. And hold on, because this is kind of trashy. Woo woo and voodoo. So Marlena Dietrich is furious that Bert would marry anyone, especially after she oh, said sure, hot and you heavy can't for, marry yeah. anyone. So when Marlena's in South Africa, she has voodoo dolls made of Angie Dickinson. Hmm? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay. So Bert and Angie at this point may be married less than a week. And Angie has to take off to film and Bert's in London. And he goes and catches Marlena's show. She's furious. Like How could you have married that slut? How could you have done such a thing? So that relationship's over. We had a thing, sort of, that involved me saying, well, actually, I guess he was the one saying no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But Bert and Angie, right? Just beginning. Or is it? So I'm going to let Bert from his book, Anyone Who Had a Heart, My Life in Music, tell you about how it goes. This is Bert. I had only been married to the Hollywood actress Angie Dickinson for about nine months when I started thinking about getting a divorce. Our problems had nothing to do with the fact that she was a much bigger star than me. I'd already had a couple affairs, 
by this time. There was a stunning violinist who was on the road with me, and another woman in New York, too. Plus, we weren't really communicating with one another. I was still pretty immature and so totally into my music that I couldn't have kept a real relationship going with anyone for an extended period of time. So maybe don't get married. Mm. Like, if you want a one-person fidelity (laughs) relationship, maybe it's not for you, dude. Sure. Sure. Listen to Marlena. Okay. It's Bird again. When Angie told me she was pregnant, I was so surprised and overjoyed at the prospect of having a child, I completely forgot about all that and began doing everything I could to keep our marriage going. They do have that child, Nikki, in 1966. Nikki is premature by three months and 20 days. Oh, my God. Which is a really tough place Even to today, start that's tough. from in yeah. life. Yeah. Nikki's going to spend the first three months of her life in an incubator. And at this time, neither Angie nor Bert understand that Nikki is going to face lifelong challenges. Sure. As a child, she starts exhibiting some disturbing behavior, odd things, sometimes violent things. Nikki will not be officially diagnosed on the autism spectrum until she's 34 years old, Mm. long after the marriage of Angie Dickinson and Bert Bacharach has fallen apart. Bumper into the 90s? She was born in the 60s? She was born in 1966. Yeah. Sadly, Nikki will die by suicide at the age of 40 Ugh. in 2007. Well, that's a terrible story. It's a terrible story. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I-, I will say it's super impressive that in 1966, they were able to keep alive a preemie. Uh, absolutely. Little, like, a- absolutely. So anyway, very sad. Okay. Angie and Bert, like trying to stay for- together for the kid, but Bert's out like, Bert's out before he was ever in. Like, he's already, he's told you he's done with it. I mean, even 1967, a year later, they separate for a while. Like, Angie's committed to being there for Nikki, and Bert loves his daughter a lot, but not doing much for the love and support of his wife. So, the marriage was done so early. They We'll always share the love of a child with challenges, but by 1973, Bert has moved out. They're going to remain separated for a long, long time before they finally divorce in 1981. Wow, that mm-hmm. is a lengthy... Separated for, mm-hmm. like, is... like Yeah, but I think for a lot of people, though, like, if you're not, if you haven't met someone and you're kind of considering getting married again, like... You're still co-parents. You're still, you know, like, I think for a lot of people, there's just no rush on actually getting divorced. Well, like, in this 73 time frame, this is when Bert bails on Hal David. He bails on Dion Warwick. He bails on Angie. Like, he, he's going through something on his entirely own thing. But even once they separate, they're both still seeing other people. Okay. Like, okay, so within all these years, Angie is going to care for Nikki. And she is going to change her movie star dreams instead to a role on television, beginning in 1974 with a little show called Police Woman, where she stars as Sergeant Pepper Anderson. Sergeant Pepper Anderson. Yeah, which makes her household name. And television, this role really is good. It allows her time to be with her daughter. It's not like a movie set, but it's not good for her marriage. Like, it It doesn't sound like much was, yeah, it doesn't sound like much was good for the marriage. But the cool thing, seriously, just side side track for a second. Police woman, the cool thing, she wears a uniform one time in the whole course of that show. Otherwise, she is in these fly fab clothes, and she's a badass. Pepper Anderson is a badass. And with Angie starring in this role, there is a surge of applications to police academies all across the United States from women. Really? In higher numbers than any, like, than women have that ever applied is outstanding. to get in the police force. Okay. What a very cool I, thing. Okay. Yay, Pepper Anderson. Mm-hmm. See who's laughing now. Okay. <laughs> so Angie's career is going fine, but it is really a life be- torn between this very glamorous, badass character you see on TV balancing caring for a child with special needs and Bert's out right so Bert and Angie separate 1981 the divorce the divorce will finally happen for them part of that 
may be that Carol Bayer Sager, Bert's next wife and songwriting partner, had been living together for almost a year now, and maybe Carol's like, hey, I'd rather have you not married to Angie Dickinson. Yeah. Bert and Carol will marry in 1982. That marriage will last until 1991, but that's a whole nother story for a whole new trashy divorces. But just a few words from Carol Bayer Sager about Bert. I think Bert needed me to write songs again, and it ended when he found a new muse 16 years younger than me. I was 15 years younger than him when he uh, first found me. Ooh. She says he was a great father, but perhaps not great husband material. Sounds like. I think Angie God. actually like says the same thing about Bert's husbanding. Like she says Bert was her big love. And this is much later. Like it's good and over. I liked him a lot, but he just never had any respect for me. Like she was smitten kitten over him and mm-hmm. he like, Okay. After the divorce, Angie's going to go on to date Johnny Carson, Hmm. Larry King, Wow, Julio Iglesias, and Harry Reasoner. She also has a standing poker night with the Gershwins for 35 years on Saturdays. Jesus. I know. Uh, But she'll never marry again. Good for her. Angie will never remarry. She still to this, like right now, living in her sweet pad atop the Hollywood Hills and being awesome. Same as she ever was. Like, Angie really is a dame. This story's been awesome to research this week. I have learned so much. But in the myriad of items, I have seen interview pieces, all the research on trashy divorces, y'all. Like, Angie Dickinson is never not classy. She is just a cool chick throughout. Bert, maybe marriage isn't your thing, Maybe buddy. marriage isn't his thing. Like, you were out before you got in, and... I mean, I think to to give some grace, we've definitely now had a number of stories where it's pretty clear that marriage just is not the thing for one of it. That's just how it is for yeah. some people. It's hard to terribly fall. And it's fault. cool. Like, whatever I mean, relationship you want to have, that's cool. I mean, you know, so if Angie Dickinson says that he was a good dad, crap husband, but good dad, he really, he did the more important part, arguably. Oh, for sure. So... But if you're looking for a marriage, yeah, it, like it's a one one partner commitment kind yeah. of thing. Not your Bert guy. Bert Bacharach, not your guy. He likes the ladies mm-hmm. and he likes the legs. Oh shit! Let me tell you this. <laughs> so when he starts dating Carol Bayer Sager, he gives her a poster of a woman's legs, and she's like, "Fragile." No, I'm short. Like, what is this supposed to? They're not my legs. Like, what message are you trying to send me? When I heard that story, it reminded me. Remember in Friends when Monica Geller, that guy writes the poem, The Empty Vase, and they're trying to, what does this poem mean? Like, what does a poster of a woman's legs mean? Like, I don't know. He's a leg man, yo. Okay. And maybe more in love with his music than he will be with any woman or their pair of legs. So I don't know how to rate trash cans for this trashy divorce. A Rat Pack casino full. Filled with voodoo dolls and there you go, long legs. I mean, it's it, it's tragic and it's sad, but fuck if uh, Angie Dickinson is not a hell of a dame. Yeah, and Burt Bacharach writes some great songs. So yeah, I'm sympathetic. I mean, we we're both people who are occasionally able to like dip into deep flow state, and I'm sympathetic to somebody who's like, actually, this is where I would like to live, and the rest of the existence is not. As appealing to me as the creative, the creative high. part. Mm-hmm. Okay, I I can sympathize with that. Yeah, I mean I totally get it. So a rat a rat pack casino full of trash cans for and voodoo for dolls rock and voodoo dolls, but no fabric of our lives. <laughs> yeah, but no cotton. <laughs> uh, maybe listen to Marlena Dietrich if she tells you something, Bert. All right, let's take a break. We're going to come on back with another dame. We are, this one a little bit more current. So many parallels, though. There's even a Friends reference. Oh. Uh-huh. Not I didn't kidding. even plan the Friends reference. That was just impromptu. All of it. I Fantastic. Know. All right, we'll be back in a minute. Hi, we're Eliza. Allison. And Carlin. And we're the hosts of Resolve Mysteries podcast. 
Our podcast follows the 80s and 90s television show Unsolved Mysteries, hosted by Robert Stack. We have a love for true crime and the unsolved. If you don't remember Unsolved Mysteries, we forgive you, but you don't have to know to get into our show. If you like true crime stuff, ghost stuff, alien stuff, or just stories about weird shit like Bigfoot, this is your podcast. The stories we cover range from totally ridiculous to truly heartbreaking. We do detailed research on all of the segments that Unsolved Mysteries aired, then drink some wine and give you the latest updates on every case. We talk about stories that will leave you laughing, crying, and occasionally outraged. Resolve Mysteries podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you get your favorite pods. Join us and perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. So Stacey, this week you're bringing us the other doll of the Rat Pack, updated style. Later Rat Pack, yeah. I call this Ocean's Awesome Mm -hmm. Julia Roberts. Who doesn't love Julia Roberts? Okay. She's a man's woman and a woman's woman. I don't know who doesn't love Julia Roberts. <laughs> I don't either. Because there are few people in the world who are as famous or as beloved as Julia Roberts. She's someone who, on the odd chance that I'm flipping channels, I will stop. She Always. is on Always. the TV screen. I wanted to uh, check out the Amazon Prime adaptation of the podcast Homecoming. And once I realized she was in it, it was like, oh, I'm going to stop putting that off now and just cue that up. And it was a really good show. Nice. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, she's just, like, purely charismatic, purely enchanting, unavoidably so. And she has really a great range as an actress. Like, she's a wonderful comedic actress, but she also, she can rock a drama. She can, she's just a really good actress. Just be real about that. Agreed. Okay. Hmm. When Julia Roberts appeared in the 2001 heist film Ocean's Eleven... She was months out of winning her first and so far only Academy Award for Best Actress for Erin Brockovich. And by golly, do I need to go back and watch a bunch of movies I haven't seen in years. I mean, you saw me watching Mystic Pizza last night. Oh, so good. Prepping for this. So let's get into the life, the many loves, and the one divorce of Julia Roberts. Julia's parents are Walter Roberts and Betty Bredemus Roberts. They met while they were in the Air Force way, Ah. way back in the 50s. They were both performing in the play George Washington Slept Here for the troops and eventually took it on tour to USO shows. They married in 1955. Their first child, who became actor Eric Roberts, was born in 56. After they left the service, they spent some time at Tulane University where Walter studied playwriting. And then they moved to Decatur, Georgia. Right down the road a piece. Right down the road, our old stomping grounds. I mean, I was there yesterday, so it's not like they're not still our stomping grounds. No, no. We we stomp there often, (laughs) but um, we both used to live five feet closer to Decatur. We did. Okay. So Betty worked for PR for Emory University. Another, like... Oh, Emory University shout out. I love this. I love this story. Okay. Walter worked in the theater. They had a short-lived children's television show on local TV, and then they started the Atlanta Actors and Writers Workshop, where... Fantastic. Get ready. You're not ready. Where famous Atlantans, Martin Luther and Coretta Scott King enrolled wow. their children. Now, really? at, at the time, a white couple allowing black children to enroll in their anything was controversial. Was controversial. Really? And so I guess, like, I think Walter was the like one-on-one acting coach for their oldest kid, for their oldest daughter. Anyway, the families got close enough that when baby Julia Roberts was born on October 28th, 1967, making her a Scorpio, Coretta Scott King paid the hospital bill. Really? Mm -hmm. Holy cats. They were that close. Now, it's worth noting, October 1967, this is getting horrifyingly close to the assassination of, Mm. right? Like, 68 was a terrible year. 68 really was a terrible year in Mm -hmm. our country. Okay. Anyway. That was the last of the good times. Let's go with that. All right. So in total, the family at this point includes mom, dad, Eric, Lisa, and now Julia. Her parents' marriage was winding down, and Betty filed for divorce in 1971, so when Julia was about four. They moved to Smyrna, which I understand oh, my you, old stomping your grounds old stomping when grounds. I was a kid, yeah. I'm never able to retain the knowledge of where Smyrna, Georgia is in relation to the city of Atlanta. It's in Cobb County. Sure. Anyway, I can never find it on a map without actually... It's west of 285. Typing in. (laughs) It's the Wild West. Okay. 
So in Smyrna, Julia attended elementary and high school. Mother married a new guy, Michael, who was a shitbag. Oh, no. He was apparently just mean. Like, I saw the word abusive used, but I don't know if that was physical or like, anyway, it just not a great marriage. It didn't, it lasted less than a decade, I think. Okay, so they would divorce when Julia was a teenager. Meanwhile, her father, Walter, you know, like divorced, but still died of cancer when she was 10. Oh, my. So Julia's childhood was not, tragedy. Yeah, was not sunbeams and rainbows and puppies and stuff. More than her fair share of trauma and sorrow. So when she graduates from high school... Hey, sorry, going to do another shout out, Campbell High School, oh, there you everybody. Go. Okay. Which is where I would have gone mm-hmm. had my parents not moved from the wild west of Atlanta over to the wild east of Atlanta. Shout out Campbell can High I, School. Can I just say, Smyrna. I'm a little bit impressed given, uh, I feel like sometimes Atlanta has a little bit of a chip on its shoulder because it's actually a very cool city. But uh, I mean, America is full of very cool cities and we often don't get our, our due. So I'm a little impressed that they haven't renamed it like Campbell-Julia <laughs> Roberts High School or something, you know? She is one of their most famous alumni. Oh, I'm sure she is. Yes. She would be the most famous alumni of most places. <laughs> okay. So she goes to Georgia State. I but... guess technically, sorry. It's alumnus because it is of both sexes. Alumni, women only, alumni, men, alumnus of Campbell High School. And that it's is important your to be proper. Weekly Trashy Divorces Latin installment. Thank you, Alicia. You're welcome. Okay, so she graduates from high school, Campbell-Julia Roberts High School, (laughs) and starts taking classes at Georgia State, but she knew early on what she wanted to do, and so she packed Well, how can you not if you're in that family? Of course you're going to be an actor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Eric had already landed. Um, Her older sister, Lisa, was in New York City already. So yeah, Uh, Julia packs her things and heads off to New York City to become an actress, And we're going to just call this the Kim Basinger Road to Stardom, because Kim Basinger (laughs) herself had trekked this from UGA in Athens back in 71 or something. Right. It did not take Julia Roberts long from her arrival in New York to start landing roles. In 1988, she had a big role in the film Satisfaction with Liam Neeson and Justine Bateman. While off screen, she lived with Liam Neeson, 20 years her elder, for a time. What? What? Next up were the deeply loved films Mystic Pizza in 88 and Steel Magnolias in 89, one of your very favorite films ever. R-E-S-P-E-C-T, still the best car scene ever in Mystic Pizza. My colors are blush and bashful. Okay, I'm done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so these would undoubtedly, I mean, these are her breakout roles, and I think they would really, like, they would be seen that way more. Drink the juice, Stacey. Drink the juice. She did receive a Golden Globe Award uh, and an Oscar nomination for Steel Magnolias. But in 1990, of course, she starred opposite Richard Gere in Pretty Woman, which was... I've heard of that. (laughs) Indisputably, this was the role that made her Julia Roberts superstar. Superstar! For sure. This rom-com Cinderella story features Roberts as a broke Hollywood sex worker who is hired by Richard Gere's rich businessman character to be his companion for a week-long stay in Hollywood. Pretty Woman became the third highest grossing film of 1990, had the highest ticket sales for a rom-com in U.S. history, and its worldwide gross stands at $463,406,268. Wow. Julia Roberts became a bona fide star just three years into her career as an actor. Can you imagine? That is a pretty fast trajectory. Do you know how much she uh, was paid for Pretty Woman? No. $300,000. Wow. Mm-hmm. She earns a little more than that these days. <laughs> I bet she, she negotiates her contracts a little differently. She earned a little more than that right away. Um, all right. So let's get a little personal with our dear suddenly superstar Julia Roberts, because while She's had just one divorce. She had a string of heartbreaks on the way there. For instance, also in 1990, she co-starred with a very cool cast of, like, young Hollywood up-and-comers in the movie Flatliners. I don't know if you remember Oh, yeah, I remember that movie. That was great. I used to watch this on cable all the time. (laughs) I found the whole premise just engrossing. All of these med students are, are trying to kill each other for 60 seconds and 
and then come back and experience near death experiences. Sounds anyway, like your fermentation group. It is very, it's very. Uh, <laughs> it is. Sorry. It was a great little movie. Anyway, so this uh, co-starred Kiefer Sutherland, and so they begin a romance, and by the summer of ninety one, they are engaged. Oh, nice. It was actually her second engagement. Oh, wow. Because okay. when she was working on Steel Magnolias with co-star Dylan McDermott, oh. they got engaged. That didn't work. Is she a fall in love with your co-star kind of gal? At this point in her life, she is, yes. Okay. Very much so. So for context, at this, like in 91, Julia Roberts is 23. Kiefer Sutherland is 24. Babies. They're babies. Yeah. They were supposed to marry in June of 91 on a 20th Century Fox soundstage in front of Hollywood's most fabulous people. Oh but my. somewhere along the way, Kiefer Sutherland was photographed repeatedly with a go-go dancer. No, no. And a no-no no dancer. Julia broke the engagement <sighs> three days before they were to walk down the aisle. Good for you, sister. Runaway bride, little practice. Yeah, so Kiefer Sutherland who I think has grown up a lot since he was 24 years old. At the time, he really, he just popped the cork on a bottle of W-H-I-N-E. And uh, <laughs> he and his friends drank heavily of the wine. And um, yeah, anyway, that was not... You're a funny girl. Not awesome. But the world did take a moment to marvel at the spectacle of Julia... On what would have been her wedding day, dining with one of Kiefer's good friends, actor Jason Patrick. Oh, my. They'd been in Lost Boys together as well as in Flatliners. She had apparently dated Jason a little bit before getting together with Kiefer, and then they ended up Rekindled having a- Rekindled the, the flame. Having a relationship later. They take a trip to Ireland together oh. and apparently hang out at U2's bassist's estate for a little privacy. This is some rarefied it's air. Seriously. Okay, they broke up too, obviously. Oh, and yeah, Jason Patrick and Kiefer Sutherland apparently were always friends. Like, they didn't even have a falling out over him kind of getting dumped right before his wedding and her just, hey, bros, who knows? Okay. I'd like to see their bro code. Yeah. All right, so there was a lot of speculation that it was sort of career rivalry that broke the Sutherland Roberts romance. So <laughs> follow the sentence if you can. So when they started dating, Donald Sutherland's son's girlfriend was known as Eric Roberts's sister. And <laughs> then, you know, there was the Oscar nomination for Pretty Woman. And suddenly Julia she Roberts... She had a name. Yeah, suddenly Julia Roberts was being offered $7 million for her next role. While Kiefer, on the same film, was offered just two and a half million. Oh. Again, these are 23 and 24-year-olds. This is a dude with Hollywood pedigree. You can kind of see how professional jealousies might work their way in. Yeah. Drive some wedges. So it seems like in the aftermath of this, Julia did feel pretty badly used by Kiefer and his people's whisper campaign about how very hurt he was. And, you know, wow, wow, wow. She told Entertainment Weekly, quote, I feel like Kiefer, for whatever reasons, tried to make it seem like he was the victim of the situation. I quite honestly believe that Kiefer knows that it's the best thing for himself and for me that it didn't happen, but he shouldn't try to make himself look better by taking shots at me. Somehow or another, it turned into Kiefer being left at the altar. Well, I just don't understand that, quite frankly. Good for her. She's, she's pretty badass. Okay. For his part, over the years, Kiefer Sutherland has definitely gained some perspective. He had this to say to people in 2016. We were young, and we were both very much in love. We decided we wanted to get married, but then this other thing kind of took over. She was arguably the most famous woman in the world. And this wedding that was supposed to be something between the two of us became something so big. People goes on to note Sutherland was the bigger star when they first met, but Robert's subsequent turn in Pretty Woman catapulted the actress to America's sweetheart level fame. I think it took a lot of courage, even amongst all of that other stuff, to be able to say, I can't do this, Kiefer Sutherland continued. I think she was being realistic for herself. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, he's not, he hasn't gotten perfect, but he. He's, Seems like he's, he's evolved a little. Mm -hmm. good, on, good on you, Kiefer. Okay, now it's time to talk about Julia's first marriage, which uh, also concluded with her only divorce. 
1993, she married country singer Lyle Lovett. Yeah, she. I love Lyle Lovett. All right, let's talk about him. Lyle is about 10 years older than she is, born November 1, 1957. So oh, also, Scorpio baby, too. Also a Scorpio. Interesting. Oh, um, I bet they really... Scorpios really do get along with others. Like, that's mm-hmm. a very good match. I It weirdly... It's a really good match. I have a lot to say about this, and as we'll hear. So he grew up in a suburb of Houston... He has his uh, BA in German and in journalism, and he is well regarded as one of the brainier musicians out there. His debut album was released in 86, and while he was well known both as a singer and actor, he met Julia on the set of The Player in 1992. His career was still climbing when they got together. Like he would actually, I think he his like awards runs coincided with his marriage to her. Okay. There was good stuff happening in his life when they were married. He's a brilliant songwriter. He's just a he's a cool dude, yeah. man. Lyle and Julia had a whirlwind three week long romance. What three? After, I thought ten was gonna top it today. <gasps> yeah, after the player came out, and they eloped in Marion, Indiana, in June 1993. Wow! Boom. Three weeks. Yeah, they lived in different time zones. Lyle would say during the marriage that between her shooting schedule and his touring, they had never spent more than seven days together. Oh wow. After the marriage, Julia told Premier Magazine, I feel liberated in a way. I feel like this really pleasant calm has descended upon my life. It has to do with your own ability to make a perfectly correct decision. I think that's quite a feat to look at something you've done and say, this is completely right. Every time I talk to him or look at his picture or think about him, I think, wow, I'm so I'm so smart. I'm so lucky. Aww. Aww. And I think I can actually understand how this would work. So Julia is a child of divorce who had a bad stepfather, turns herself into a Hollywood star at a really young age, has some Hollywood romances, but butts up against the career pressures and the vague ideas of what 20-something dudes think their wives should be. And then she meets Lyle, who certainly, I mean, he's got an acting career too. Like he can play in Hollywood, but he's not a Hollywood guy. He's older. He's bright and funny and he's relaxed about himself and he's got his own thing that he has built himself. He's not trying to constrain her and he doesn't need her to fawn over his awesomeness. They can just be who they are together. I mean, it really... Sounds ideal. Yeah. So she told people in 94, I think that when you have a great love and you're secure in that, it doesn't matter how far apart you are. I feel wherever I go, I now, by virtue of being married, represent both of us. Lyle would visit her on her various movie sets, and people would say things like, yeah, they'd kiss each other hello and goodbye morning and night. Julia always spoke so highly of him. They seemed very much in love. But there were things. Julia would be spotted out without her wedding ring on, or Lyle would be photographed exiting the hotel of a female country singer in Austin at night. Ooh. Twice. Julia was spotted crying on the shoulder of Jason Patrick. Oh, boy. Or hanging out on a beach with Richard Gere, freshly separated from his wife. So there were things. There were things. The tabloids yeah. are the tabloids. I mean, so here's here's how Lyle Lovett's life changed when he married Julia Roberts. Because they lived separate lives, when he was home from the road, if she was off shooting, the National Enquirer took to positioning two vehicles outside of his home. So there was a reporter in one and a photographer in the other, just in case a woman should come or go from his home. Can you imagine living under that kind of scrutiny? I uh, I can't. Honestly, I can't. That is... Yeah, no, it's upsetting. It's upsetting. Mm-hmm. All right, so on March 28th, 1995... Julia's publicist released a joint statement from the couple announcing their separation. They'd been married just 21 months, and all the reporting suggests that it was not a trashy divorce at all. But come on, we're talking about Lyle Lovett and Julia Roberts, and it would honestly be unexpected if they had gone into some kind of all-out divorce war. It's even said that they've stayed friends. I would be a little surprised if they were the kind of people who, like, pick up the phone and call each other all the time, though. But there's no animosity. Didn't seem that way. Yeah. And even if there was, they both definitely made a point of never expressing that in public. Like, the Classy shit she... Classy people! I know, the shit she went through with Kiefer Sutherland, she did not... She does not have to go through that again. Friends reference. After the divorce, Julia appeared in a season two episode of Friends, where she dated Chandler Bing. 
Oh, I forgot about that. She did. Which resulted, because she dates her co-stars, resulted in her dating Matthew Perry for a couple of years. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that that was likely, that relationship was probably complicated because I know Perry at the time was really dealing with kind of substance misuse issues. So anyway, that flamed out by about 96. After that, she dated Benjamin Bratt for a couple of years. Oh, I remember. God. Yeah, no, she's... This is the... Mm-hmm fabric of our lives talk about some cotton seriously okay i'm flashing back all right so professionally i am trying to think of a dry spell that julia roberts has had to weather and none are coming to mind she starred opposite denzel washington in 93's the pelican brief she's created global box office mega hits like my best friend's wedding with dermot mulroney cameron diaz and rupert everett Notting hill paired her with hugh grant in 99 she played a rom-com role that may have been near and dear to her actual biography with Runaway Bride, back together with Richard Gere. Then in 2000, she wins her Oscar for Erin Brockovich and her fight against PG&E, which I think... Great movie. I think today's Californians might really relate to fighting against PG&E. Afterwards, she and Brad Pitt, who had been wanting to work together for a while, found a project called The Mexican, which was their first on-screen partnership. They would get back together in 01 with... Ocean's Eleven, the reboot. The reboot, 41 years later. 41 years later. So she plays Tess Ocean, which is who Angie Dickinson played. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The ex-wife of, I refer to um, Danny Ocean as a heist project manager. Does that make sense to you? Totally makes sense. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> um, okay, so she's the ex-wife of heist project manager Danny mm-hmm. Ocean, played by George Clooney. Brad Pitt is one of the co-stars. This thing grossed. $450 million worldwide. It is an awesome movie. The Oceans series is excellent. Even Oceans 8 that came out, I think, last year. Mm-hmm. Really enjoyed that one. All of this is... I'm into heist movies. I really, really like the Oceans franchise. Okay. While she was working on The Mexican with Brad Pitt, she met cameraman Daniel Motor. So she was still dating Benjamin Bratt. And Motor was married at the time, but a year later, they were both single, and they wed on July 4th, 2002, in Taos, New Mexico, and they've been together ever since. So 18 years. Mm-hmm. They have three, wow. three kids. Yep. Good for them. So today, Julia Roberts is a glowing 52 years young. She's one of the most famous women in the world, one of Hollywood's most bankable talents, a three-time Golden Globe winner, and eight-time Golden Globe nominee. A four-time Academy Award nominee, on top of her win for Best Actress for Aaron Brockovich. Her movies have raked in a total of $2.8 billion. Wow. That is some smackaroos. Some, some scratch. Mm-hmm. Her personal net worth is estimated around $170 million. Good for her. And this is the part where normally we would assign trash cans, but I think in this case, Julia and Lyle both get halos instead. Like, this is all speculation, but I think that Julia's relationship with Lyle was probably her first healthy adult relationship with a man who was up to the task of being her equal and was capable of accepting her as his equal without competition or jealousy. The marriage didn't work out, but the Julia Roberts who exited the marriage seemed different than the one who went into it. Her personal life was more serious. Her relationships were a little longer lasting. And it seems like they were sort of more appropriately contextualized within the broader life she was living. Insofar as there was a lot of Hollywood romance stuff, tabloid coverage of, you know, Kiefer Sutherland, of all of that. I feel like that really died down. Like she oh, was absolutely. She was more able to, like, I don't know. She grew up, I think, in her relationship with Lyle Lovett. Awesome. Okay, so I'm sure that the end of that, I mean, come on, obviously it was hard on both of them, but there were no unkind words said in the press. Both appear to have remained really supportive of each other. And, you know, she's gone on to a long, happy marriage. He married in 2017, remarried in 2017, and hopefully is extraordinarily happy as well. I got no, I, it's, I got no trashy anything about Julia Roberts. No, well done. That's all the halos. Yeah. Sometimes it just doesn't work. Yeah. That's okay. Wait. <laughs> sometimes the trashy part just doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. No, sometimes the marriage doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. And that's okay. That's It makes that's you better truth. and it mm-hmm. makes you better for the one that will. Mm-hmm. So, well yeah. done, Stacey. Hey, thanks. 
Well done. Thanks. It seems like they were super, super happy together up until they realized that just there was never going to be, I don't know, like a separate them together. It would be challenging Mm -hmm. if you're Julia Roberts. Mm Mm-hmm. And I love it. He's on the road always. He's a workaholic. He's, and, and again, I'm sure we're decades on now. I'm sure it's, I'm sure he also contextualizes his life differently now, but yeah. Well, two really classy dames on Trashy Divorces this week and their we're gonna have a, songwriting husbands. Yeah, we're going to have a bunch of music and video clips uh, online uh, on TrashyDivorces.com for this episode including uh, a lot of interviews with Angie Dickinson, which you encouraged me to watch to see really just how strikingly they favor each they other. They favor each other. That's they the term. They really, re- it is Angie not... Dickinson and Julia Roberts favor each other in surprising ways, yeah. It's not a stretch to see why Julia got that role in Ocean's Eleven. Like, I've never really thought they looked alike before, but there is some classic footage that will shock you with how much they favor each other yeah i was i was surprised had no idea until next week and we see you again friends keep Keep it trashy trashy. so trashy no voodoo dolls though stay away from that Mm. wear your cotton (laughs) bye y'all bye (laughs) trash pandas thanks for listening trashy divorces is written and produced by us stacy and alicia for hemlock creatives you can contact us at trashy divorces at gmail.com our art is by Sydney V. Smith, Sydney V. Smith at carbonmade.com. And our music is used with permission of Ratsy. You can find her at Ratsy Store on Instagram. Big thanks to our season five associate producer, Melanie Z. Check out episode sources, photos, soundtracks, merch store, and more at trashydivorces.com. Need more trash candy? Our Patreon community includes some of the bestest humans around, as well as a bunch of bonus content every week. Join the fun at patreon.com slash trashy divorces. Last but not least, come play with us on social. We are at trashy divorces at Instagram, which Alicia mostly runs. Twitter, which Stacy mostly runs. And on Facebook, which, which we, we split. split. <laughs> we also have a trashy divorces discussion group on Facebook. If you want to chat with other trashy divorces listeners. Thanks again for listening. Keep, Keep it, it trashy. trashy y'all. <laughs>